Hello, and welcome to Chapter 3 of Maintaining Creativity, Eight Artists as Agents of Change. My name is Scott Walker. I'm the Executive Director of the Canadian Artist Network, and like most of you, I'm an elder artist, and I'm very pleased welcoming you here today. In fact, it's a great pleasure to welcome artists from right across Canada, from every large provincial city, from St. John's to Victoria, and from smaller centres, Happy Valley Goose Bay and Newfoundland and Labrador, Gananoque, Ontario, Bowen Island, BC, and everywhere else where artists live and create. And I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we do live, work, travel, and create on the traditional territories of Indigenous peoples who have cared for this land, now called Canada, since time immemorial. We acknowledge this as part of our covenant with all Indigenous nations to share, respect, and protect the land in the spirit of peace and friendship, and to honour the future generations of all our nations. Today is the final chapter of Maintaining Creativity 8. Where did the time go? We've been working on this for almost a year. I can't believe it's almost over. And we're going out with the original gig work, the original gig workers, strategies towards economic stability. Are we the original gig workers? We must be because it was artists who invented the term gig. It was coined by jazz musicians about 100 years ago as slang for engagement. We all know that the life of an artist is a precarious one, but some parts of the world, in fact, some parts of Canada, have support mechanisms in place. We're going to explore some of those today. I'm going to make a request, not right now, of you, but for next week, you will be receiving a request to fill out a survey, which will happen through SurveyMonkey, and we really, really urge you to fill it out. It will not only be about today's uh, chapter, but all three chapters. Even if you haven't attended them, we want to know what you think about what you have seen. It's very important, not only for the people who are sponsoring this uh, conference, but also for the New Horizons for Seniors. It's part of our agreement. Uh, with them. So when you receive the link, please fill it out. We promise we'll make it as painless as possible. We've been featuring uh, videos of some of our mentorships this week. We're celebrating the fact that we just passed $400,000 in fees we've paid to mentors and expenses to mentees. We're helping to develop the next generation of artists who will become agents of change. Here's another example of one of our mentorships. My name is Pierre Coupe, and I've been a visual artist for, gosh, close to 70 years now, I guess. 60 years? I started when I was seven. And uh, I was amazed that uh, that Canadian Artist Network set me up with Margarita Feinstein rather quickly. Uh, one of the things that uh, I thought was really remarkable about the mentorship program and what Margarita in particular wanted to do was that she did have concrete objectives. Uh, concrete objectives for the visual objects that she was going to be making in resin and concrete objectives for the text that would accompany them and be a part of them and integrated into them. So we were able to work on two aspects of her, of her project uh, simultaneously and I think that was a, uh, a bonus. Uh, it made the whole thing a little bit richer for both of us, I think. I didn't really have a mentor when I was young. And uh, I think it would have been a, a benefit to me. So I think that this is a, a, a good thing to have happen. Um, hi, my name is Margarita Feinstein. I'm a multimedia artist. I approached the mentorship program with a great hope to uh, meet another artist. And working with Pierre was really rewarding. And I've got a lot of positive input from this collaboration, I would say. One of the main aspects I um, got from this was really creative writing, writing in a way that I really imagined, ever imagined I would manage. And my artwork is based on a lot of um, history and literature, dance, visual art. I'm on for any reference he could give me and he gave me lists of other poets and artists and so on. And I've got an amazing friend because <laughs> it became sort of a friendship and you know, it's, uh, it's great. Thank you to Pierre Coupe and Margarita Feinstein. 
A quick outline now of how Chapter 3 is going to unfold. I will introduce today's moderator in a second. He will introduce the panelists, and then they will discuss today's topics, the original gig workers. And then we'll begin our breakouts. They're like our online salons, our on salons. Uh, a chance to discuss today's topic with other artists from right across Canada. Each breakout will have a facilitator and last about 30 minutes, and then we'll all gather back here to find out what each group talked about. So, without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our moderator for Chapter 3. He's no stranger to the Canadian Artist Network. In fact, he helped found it. He is the chair of the board of CAN. He was instrumental in the development of uh, CAN as its predecessor, CSARN, and as the uh, impetus for the report that led to the founding of this organization. He's also my predecessor as executive director and he's a highly respected cultural policy expert, so he knows one or two things about today's topic. Please welcome Gary Neal. Thank you very much, Scott. I'm delighted to be here. I'm delighted to be with this very distinguished panel, and I'd like to welcome everybody who's here. Uh, artists are indeed fundamental to every society. Artists work in unique ways, and artists are the original gig workers. The 1980 UNESCO recommendation concerning the status of the artist calls on all member states to recognize this important role and to implement policies and programs that address the economic reality of professional artists. Canada responded to the report by approving our Status of the Artist Act 32 years ago. So where are we in Canada today? And what do we need to do to improve the economic and social situation of professional artists, particularly those who are older and still practicing their profession? We have three outstanding panelists to discuss this topic. The first is Fern Downey. She's an actor. She's had a long and distinguished career, which continues today. She's also been a powerful advocate for women's rights in the screen and entertainment business and was president of ACTRA from 2009 to 2017. In 2021, just a couple of years ago, she stepped down after nine years as president of the International Federation of Actors. FIA represents several hundred thousand performers through its 90 member organizations around the world. Carl Beveridge is a visual artist. Through his photography, he addresses a broad range of contemporary social and political issues from racism and sexism to workers' rights and environmental issues. He has exhibited around the world. Carl is also a social justice activist and a longtime active member of CARFAC. I think I first met Carl many decades ago at a meeting of the Toronto and District Labour Council. Anne-Marie de Roche is a cultural policy expert with a long history in the sector. When she worked for Union des Artistes, she was influential in lobbying for many of the important artist-centered policies that make Quebec a world leader. Well, she, she will review some of these unique provisions. I'm sure she will remind us that professional artists in Quebec, in Quebec continue to have challenges. Before turning to the panelists, I wanna put on the table some important basic facts about the situation for professional artists in Canada today. The median income of the 202,000 professional artists is 44% lower than that of all workers. Five out of the 11 in total stats can categories of professional artists earn less than the poverty line. Most artists are self-employed and work from contract to contract. Most spend a great deal of time preparing to earn income, writing the screenplay, painting the paintings, practicing and rehearsing, or looking for the next gig. Artists have some unique health and safety concerns. Artists' income can fluctuate greatly from year to year, and this is unfair at tax time. As freelancers, artists have to pay both the employer and employee shares of CPP, and they can collect EI when they aren't working, even if they've made EI contributions in non-arts employment. And then from the original report that led to the creation of CAN, we found that 61% of older professional artists are at moderate or high financial risk. I've been working in the cultural policy field for more, more than 20, 45 years. And in fact, I served 
on the Canadian Government Advisory Committee that led to the adoption of Canada's Act. Although I should add that the committee wanted so much more than the bargaining rights that were the only substantive measure. While it sometimes look cha looks challenging, I think we're at a moment when major gains are possible. There's renewed interest globally. This, is a rise, it, this arises in my view from the essential role that artists played during the pandemic. The fact that we're finally addressing the fundamental changes brought about by the digital technologies and streaming and the threat of AI. The positive signs include an EU parliament draft resolution that's still being debated, new initiatives in Spain, the Scandinavian countries and elsewhere, a recent international labor organization report focuses on improving working conditions in the cultural industries in Africa. WIPO published a significant report on how streaming services are not properly compensating musical performers and, and, and musical artists. In August, the G20 culture ministers meeting in India issued a call to action, urging the integration of decent work goals in cultural policies. In our own country, the government has just tabled its response to the report of the House of Commons Standing Committee that looked at the status of the Artist Act. While the Standing Committee had several positive recommendations, the government was a little bit wishy-washy, but at least it gives us an opportunity to pursue some of our goals. So with that, I did, would invite Fern to share with her, her thoughts, both as a professional actor and as a uh, someone who's been involved in policy discussions for many years. Thank you, Gary. That was a great intro for all of us and I'm delighted to be here. The other sessions have been fan-freaking-tastic. So let me get started and share a little bit of my personal story. I'm a Maritimer by birth and upbringing. My mother was of Scottish heritage and was raised on a farm in Pictou County, Nova Scotia. My father was of Irish heritage and raised on a farm in Albert County, New Brunswick. Both families were musically gifted, but no one made their living from their love of music. With that solid Celtic background, it was quite a surprise to my parents that I was neither a gifted singer nor a pianist. I became an actor the first professional artist in the family, and it caused consternation, as you can imagine. The hope was that I would go to law school, but I went to theater school instead. My father's concern that it would be a very hard way to make a living was true. It was, but I did manage to make a somewhat lumpy living for 45 continual years and counting. I am 68 years old. In my twenties, I acted, produced plays, ran small theater companies in Halifax, did live stand-up radio, learned publicity and marketing and scraped together a modest living while always creating new Canadian shows with partner playwright Paul Ledoux. He was one of the best things about Halifax. When we moved to Toronto in 1984, we both found a welcoming place in television and film, which was somewhat of a surprise. Pay was better. My family was relieved that our economic fortunes were becoming a bit more stable. Work life was still precarious, but the pay was better when you worked. In 1991, I ran for Actor Council and for 30 years, I advocated on behalf of professional performers in English language recorded media in Canada. Eight years as the national president and spokesperson. Then I served, as Gary said, as president of FIA, the International Federation of Actors for nine years, and as vice president on the executive of the Canadian Labour Congress. And in all these fora, I brought the concerns of the financial precarity of Canadian artists as the original gig workers forward at every opportunity. And it was somewhat surprising that most people really have no idea how challenging living this life is, how wildly our incomes fluctuate, and how absent meaningful social safety nets are. The tax laws are unkind to artists with variable incomes. One great earning year lands you in the horrible situation of having to pay quarterly tax installments in advance, as if you were going to earn that same wonderful amount the following year, which rarely happens. In my world, at least three close friends who were screenwriters had their bank accounts cleaned out by CRA 
when they didn't have sufficient income to pay their taxes in advance. The reason? They were developing new work and had literally no income that year. Which is one of the reasons ACTRA and other unions and associations in the Canadian arts and culture lobby, lobby the, the feds to change the Income Tax Act. If you respect artists, if you value our contributions, say it. I just want to quote very briefly from actress interesting recent pre-budget submission to the feds. And I will quote, actress admits that provisions of budget 2024 that address arts and culture should focus primarily on improving the economic circumstances of professional artists, including targeted measures that address the reality of how artists work, support the professional organization they have created, and acknowledge the vital role artists play in society. So what if the first $15,000 of professional artistic income were tax-free? What if the introduction of a four-year back averaging system for professional income ensured tax fairness? What if the employment insurance program was changed to permit self-employed artists to receive regular benefits if they paid into the system? And as Gary elucidated at the beginning, there's a, a glimmer of hope as the Parliamentary Committee on the Status of the Artist Report, you know, shared some, some of those same recommendations, including EIB amended, consider tax measures, and the Income Tax Act be amended. We know that the global pandemic increased our financial precarity terribly. CERB individually saved our bacon. I think we owe respect to all our unions and professional associations who fought so hard for insisting that artists be eligible to receive the CERB benefit. It also was a pretty interesting case study in a future possible guaranteed basic income. And what modest financial safety $2,000 a month brought in such an anxious and perilous time. So personally, I'm staking a lot on the federal government finally finding some ways to support professional artists economically. Back in 92, when we achieved federal status of the artist legislation, as Gary said, our biggest win was in the collective bargaining arena, which is significant, but we have so much further to go. 92 was a long time ago. If there ever was a time, I think we all agree, surely it is now. During the pandemic, when the whole world literally ground to a halt, music, books, TV, film, and art kept citizens going. And lastly, I want to talk very briefly about artists and RRSPs, which grow up to be RRIFs. It's not an ideal system that we have in Canada, as withdrawals are easy to make. And when financially pressed, many of us did that very thing, withdrew. The system works when we don't access that saved money and let the beauty of compound interest do its thing. I just wanted to share with you that during a, a recent trip to Vancouver, I was alarmed by the number of talented designers working in the movies who had retired with no cushion, no RSP. And their, their financial hardship was great. The pandemic was kind to no one. And the SAG after strike meant US service production in BC ground to a halt. But it also suggested to me that some did not see the benefit of having an RRSP at all. Their young selves didn't plan for the days of lower earnings. We may not retire, but we tend to earn less as senior artists. And it crystallizes for me the way we have to talk to each other and interact with each other and encourage each other to understand our money and to put money away when we have it and fight like blazes for understanding in society. The next rainy day usually comes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fern. Carl. I, um, I hope you can hear me. And uh, thank you for inviting me to participate today. It's been a while since I've been involved in stuff like this, so it was good to um, have to think it through again. Um, 
One of the things that struck me is there's three groups in Canada that have been excluded from labor legislation. Those are farm workers, domestic workers, and artists. And these are three groups that are essential to the food, care, and amusement of the wealthy. So how do I earn a living? It's a combination of many things. It's exhibition and reproduction fees. It uh, was grants until fairly recently. Uh, commissions and the odd sale. Plus part-time teaching, arts administration, and odd jobs. At one time I was doing polo, polling for uh, Gallup and going around door to door, which was sort of interesting, but it was very grinding work. But one of the main things in terms of survival, and I think this is true of many artists, is you learn to live really cheaply. You buy secondhand clothes, you shop in markets, um, and you, you live on as little as possible. And that's part of how you survive. Now, of course, I get you know very minimal CPP, I think $150 a month, which isn't much, um, old age security and guaranteed income supplement and managed to get by. One of the things is that myself and many artists rejected the market model and have exhibited mostly in artist run centers and public galleries that pay now fees. I mean, the expectation is that artists, visual artists in particular, would earn their income from sales and grants and fees were simply add-ons. But very few artists benefit from sales. And particularly in Canada, and particularly when I was a younger artist, there wasn't much of a market in Canada, which led to the rise of both Carfac and then artist-run centers. For artists who work locally, there's even a more limited market. Major in public institutions tend to favor international market. Witness the AGO's recent announcement of their expansion being dedicated to international contemporary art, not local contemporary art. But culture is rooted in the local. It's what we know and experience. It's the place and land that we live in. And the local also allows us to connect to an immediate community community to immediate audience. And also local communities can provide some social and economic support. Part of my income and part of my livelihood is derived from working with trade unions and social justice movement. But it's not only the production of work, but helping to develop the cultural capacity and the infrastructure within the movement. And I've been involved in developing Mayworks and the Workers' Arts and Heritage Center is two examples of building that infrastructure within unions. And that's really important because if we want the support of the broader society, we need to be engaged with those people, just beyond being an audience, but being actively engaged with them in a kind of cultural politics. I've also been involved, as Gary mentioned, with Carfac and RAV. Rob being our sister organization in Quebec, Les Regroupement des Artistes en Art Visuel. And we jointly negotiated a collective agreement with the National Gallery of Canada under status. It took us 12 years. They couldn't believe that artists who they love and cherish would have the impertinence to negotiate. After six years of disbelief, they finally hired a corporate lawyer who claimed that copyright superseded status and that we couldn't negotiate a minimum under uh, in the collective agreement. In other words, we couldn't negotiate copyright fees. The interesting thing, and they said this in front of the Supreme Court when we finally got to the Supreme Court over this issue, that the artists had the right to be paid less. Fortunately, the Supreme Court immediately ruled, they ruled from the bench, that status established a minimum payment and is compatible with copyright. It was a, a major important case. In terms of negotiations under status, the most difficult area that we confronted was how you resolve dispute resolution. Grievances, often resulting in arbitration, are one of the more costly undertakings that unions do. 
one major grievance we realized could bankrupt us as an organization. I mean, Carfax has an annual operating budget nationally of $250,000, roughly, to $300,000. So we're not a very wealthy organization. What we had to do in the end is accept a model of a joint resolution committee, where in the end, we would have to let a grievance go if the uh, National Gallery decided to take it to arbitration. But we were hoping that at least through a joint committee, we'd be able to resolve most issues. Another issue for us that came up in bargaining or in subsequent bargaining was the cutoff date for the exhibition right. For, the use, for those who don't know what the exhibition right is, it's that the public exhibition of a work in a public gallery is falls under copyright. In other words, it's a clause within copyright itself. Intense lobbying from the museum sector, a uh, deal was made that the Act only recognized the copyright of works made after 1988 for exhibition. We argue subsequently that that cutoff is discriminatory against senior artists, and most major institutions these days ignore it. But the National Gallery stubbornly replied they only follow the law, and that Carfax Rav would have to change the law rather than put it into a collective agreement, which it would be our legal. Uh, which would be legally binding. Of course, the real obstacle facing collective bargaining, which I think is one of the more important tools we have, is the lack of provincial legislation, because the majority of who we can negotiate with fall under provincial jurisdiction. And of course, Anne-Marie, I assume, would be talking about Quebec, which fortunately is more advanced than the rest of us. Another issue of particular relevance for senior artists, but for all artists, is the resale right. For those not familiar, the resale right is to establish a percentage, usually 5%, of the increased value of a work sold on the secondary market would go to the artist. Carfax Rav has been lobbying for years to establish the resale right. Um, many countries have enacted it. And while promised with each round of copyright reform, it still has to be established in Canada. And again, it's promised in the next round of copyright reform. So we're fighting for that still. Another campaign that would benefit not only all artists, but all gig workers and people as a whole is basic income, and people have already mentioned that. And I'm not going to get into a discussion. There's various forms of a basic income. But I think the most important principle is that any basic income has to uh, maintain existing social programs. And in our case, maintain production grants and fees. An early attempt at a notion of a basic income was undertaken by the Inter Independent Artists Union in the mid eighties. We had a slogan, a living wage for a living culture. It argued that artists were dependent contractors on government funding. Instead of com competitive grants, um, we recommended that the government pay an artist a living wage and use grants for material production. We actually did get a meeting with the Ontario Arts Council at the time, but the I, uh, Independent Artists Union fell apart when many members, and probably justifiably argued, that we should be fighting for a basic income for all. But a uh, <clears throat> struggle for basic income continues, um, with a, a lot of focus being put on uh, the arts. In fact, my son is one of the campaigners in that. Um, a unique feature of the visual arts is that we make objects, we make commodities that are bought and sold. And the problem for um, senior artists is that upon death, that inventory can be taxed. And for some artists, that would be a huge amount of money. Um, as a photographer, however, and this is true of maybe many media artists, I've designated my inventory of prints as exhibition only. In other words, all the prints that I have, which you know have suffered wear um, through exhibitions, are not for sale. What I sell actually is a digital file of the image from which the buyer can make various prints for display. And this might work 
for artists working in the media. It probably wouldn't work for painters, unfortunately. Um, a last comment. Status and collective bargaining imply a working artist in the sense of a worker, as opposed to the idea of the individual creative genius. And like all workers, some of us work differently than others, which is fine, as long as we can all earn a living and, res and respect for what we do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carl and Marie. Yeah, well, thank you for inviting me, uh, getting me out of my uh, my little cupboard or something, because I haven't been talking about status of the artist for a long time, but I'm always prized, proud to do to do so because um, I think in Quebec the status of the artist is a permanent discussion. It's a sector of intervention for the ministry, and there's a directorate whose mission is to find. Uh, solutions to the difficulties that are inherent to the uh, practice of art. Um, it, it's uh, social, uh, socio-economic conditions of artists is a, a, a venue for the the government too, and uh, they want to develop an expertise and and solutions and in, in evaluate the impact of actions. So it's always there. It's it's always a discussion, a permanent discussion that is very important. And I think it's a it's a basis. Uh, we, some people were talking about provincial involvement in uh, the taxation and the policies, and I think that uh, it's crucial for artists to have the provincial governments uh, deal with this. The Status of the Artists Act was renewed last year. I'm not gonna get into the negotiating aspect, but it does include, again, the uh, provisions on psychological and sexual harassment that wasn't there. So it's the conditions of, of artists. Uh, it allowed the government to set by regulation minimum conditions for the conclusion of pro professional contracts with artists. So if there is, instead of having a mediator or something, the government can uh, get, uh, get to the, the point and, and uh, submit uh, a general condition. And it includes now digital arts and uh, circus. Um, so that that's very important because we feel that the government, the artists and the government, uh, they have the support of the government most of the time. I'm gonna get you back in 2002 when I was at the uh, Union des Artistes with Pierre Curzi and Raymond Legault. Um, they were very uh, keen about the economic condition of artists. Um, there were lots of, re uh, organizations who were asking for uh, money, more money uh, all the time to the Arts Council to, to, of Quebec, of Canada. But we realized when I started studying the contracts of our performers, uh, that money they never got down to the artists. It, it stayed in the organization. Of course, the performances were, were going on and, and at least it was settled, but the artists per se did not get anything. And the government at the time said, listen, we don't have much money. Uh, we won't be able to give a lot of millions of dollars to arts organization, but we may want to look at other venues, other ways of helping the artists. And this is when we started saying, okay, let's, let's go for a social security net for artists. And um, that was in 2004 and five. Couple, there are several measures that were put in place, but one of them was the copyright revenue. You alluded that uh, to to that, uh, Gary. Um, now it's the income from selling your content, public performance, reproduction right, and royalties for content borrowed in libraries. Uh, is deductible. So if you're making between zero and fifteen thousand dollars of revenue of copyright, you, it's you get the, the amount deducted of what you get. Between if you get fifteen thousand to thirty thousand dollars, you get fifteen thousand deducted from your revenue uh, from copyright. 
and then it 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 goes down. It progressively goes down up to the sixty thousand dollars. So that's that's something. And for older artists as well, if you get copyright, it's interesting because it's a legacy that you have. It's it's something. It's like a a pension plan. So if you wrote books and and and, and you have other copyright uh, works, then you know it's it's at least uh, something to look at. In 2020, in 2020, there were 15,000 beneficiaries of that, and that measure cost only 9.5 million to the, the the government. So, you know, it's not the Irish royalty-free, uh, tax-free uh, copyright of Ireland, but I mean, we don't need to have Bono taking advantage of our tax reform. But, you know, I, I think this this is a venue that is, that that I like very much. <laughs> and then uh, the the other one was the income averaging. Yves Seguin at the time, he was the Minister of Finance or uh, Revenue, I don't recall, but he said, you know, you don't ask for the right things. You have to, you know, we have to recognize that your revenues are fluctuating. And and, and he says, listen, we could do this, blah, blah, blah. and he sort of drew something on the napkin and said, well, let's let's work around that. And so we have to buy an annuity when you do a, a you make a lot of money one year and less the other year. Then you take $25,000, you have to pay tax on that. But then you have seven years, it's a tax deferral thing, you have seven years to average it. If you sell a major work of, at the museum, your work of art, you get $100,000, then you don't have to pay the whole, uh, as, as Fern said, you don't have to, to have uh, tax uh, paid all the time. Um, but this has, in 2020, only 12 people benefited from that measure. And so it cost to the government is less than half a million. So either it was not well adapted, <laughs> it's not known. I know that, I, I heard that ACTRA is working, uh, has submitted uh, some sort of tax averaging scheme. Uh, you know, you have to be careful, but, you know, it needs work, in my view. <laughs> This one needs work, but it's it's something that um, that do, people should look at. Um, I I want to get into the challenges. Uh, we have, I think, in Quebec, we have a bright cultural sector, uh, very dynamic. Uh, the twelfth of August is a uh, buy a Quebec book. And for the past 10 years, 12 of August, it started 10 years ago, and now it has increased the sale of 650% more Quebec books are being sold than 10 years ago. Uh, out of the top 10 movies last month, three weeks ago, out of the top 10 movies in Quebec, four were Quebec movies. So, you know, it's, it's, it's very bright and yet the challenges are enormous. The French was used to be a barrier of international content. It's not anymore. Uh, international content is here. TVA, the main broadcaster, private broadcaster in Quebec, has announced yesterday the layoff of 547 people. And I think CTV did the layoffs too. Uh, inflation. And people have a sense of general injustice towards the people who still make a lot of money while they're struggling. So live, live performances, the capacity is between 49 and 65 percent. So people are now um, busy. The population is focused on its basic needs. Uh, not on the soul of the country and not on uh, the artists who are make, who make them happy and so on. They're, they're struggling. And if I had um, an advice or a point to make is that artists should not make a recommendation because they're entitled to. It's not an entitlement. 
I, I think there are, but uh, uh, it's not going to be seen like that in the population. We have to uh, seem to be equitable in the what we demand of the governments uh, for that. If we want a minimum revenue, it's and if that's what we need, I think it's needed for everybody in the population. A copyright deduction, that's equitable because it's your work. Uh, tax averaging is, is, is equitable because it, it takes care of, it, it recognizes the, the, the value and the way the art sector works. But you have to be careful as to not getting into entitlement or, you know, very, be, be very concrete and mostly have the population behind you. Uh, if you don't have the population behind you and if you don't feel that, we, we have to engage. Carl said that. Uh, I think that artists have to engage with the population and vice versa. And then it's going to be uh, a general fight for uh, equity and a social security net that is equitable to all. Thank you very much, Anne-Marie. Uh, thank you to all three panelists. I think you put on the table a lot of the issues and some very good perspectives. Um, let me ask you to zero in on taxes, because we've talked about a number of different elements of, of tax measures that would support artists. Um, first of all, I think we should all recognize our tax system is replete. If you want to talk about special measures, our, our tax system has all sorts of measures for farmers, for fishers, for hairdressers, for taxi drivers. My favorite is there are provisions uh, for people, persons in religious orders who take a vow of per perpetual poverty. That could be artists. Maybe we should just form a <laughs> order. Uh, so they have special rules. There's all sorts of special rules. So we've, and there are some for artists too, you know, in, in government speak, there's income tax folio S4, F14, C1, artists and writers. So there are some special rules. So we've talked about a number of things. Um, the possibility of the first 10 to $15,000 of artistic income being tax-free, uh, deductions for, tax deductions for copyright income, so more narrowly defined perhaps, uh, income averaging, um, uh, refundable tax credit for artistic income. So there's models of, of all of those kinds. Uh, and But given what uh, Anne-Marie said, particularly that, uh, what was it, 15,000 artists uh, gained from the tax-free income, whereas only 12 artists were able <laughs> make a gain from the annuity formulation of income averaging. Let me just put it forward to the to the to each panelist to, to ask you just reflect on what you think the strongest measures would be. Are there other measures that we're missing? Is this question of grants being uh, taxable, whereas sports grants are not? Is that is that an element? So just reflect a little bit if you could on that. So maybe Fern, you could start. Well, it was fascinating listening to Anne-Marie go into more detail in Quebec, because, of course, we all bow down and worship Quebec, at least having some provincial advantage and understanding of what it is to struggle as an artist. Um, and, and informed by Carl, too, because we both worked in the space of, you know, we're cultural workers. We want, we want, we're just, we're workers, we're Canadian workers. We happen to be cultural workers who make very erratic income. So it, it's a complicated thing. I, 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 I'm still fascinated by income tax back averaging. Now I understand in Quebec that the annuity did, has not worked so well thus far. But once you have to do something like buy an annuity, I mean, heck at AFBS, we can hardly get people to sign for their RSP, which they have to to open one up. So when you have to do something, that, that becomes a barrier. But I still think there's merit in income tax averaging of some kind, be it four years back or forward, because the number of people in, at least in the arts, in the television and film business, who have lost homes, who have had to relocate, who have been absolutely demolished by that one beautiful year where they sold a script or a film or got a TV series for one year and never again, it, it demolished um, their whole lives having to try to pay the quarterly tax installments in advance and the HST 
taxes in advance. It, it, it's a, a burden. So all of these things have individual merits and it's hard to discern without being a, a spider on the wall at you know Income Tax Canada, what they might be most amenable to. But I hear you, Anne-Marie, it's, it's gotta be of the perception of equitable. When I was lobbying Prime Minister Stephen Harper, he really believed that artists were entitled no matter how broad we made our pitch, how generous we, you know, um, we wanted all of society to be picked up, not just artists, but it, it, that is the trick. I think that is the, the thing that, and I, that's why I do believe coming out of the pandemic, there's, I feel more cultural support and understanding of artists than ever before. That artists were so broke, they were doing music shows in their kitchen, you know, and you could pay mm -hmm. on PayPal. Like that, people used to think that we were all individually prosperous when we were just barely hanging on, just barely. So I have no solutions, but I'm fascinated to know what provinces could do to assist us. I don't, I don't feel like we, I've ever felt support in the province of Ontario. Carl, what do you think? Yeah, uh, Carl, uh, uh, I, I particularly uh, noted what you said about your own personal circumstances, and thank you for sharing that, where your CPP is a minimal amount. Uh, you're nowhere near the maximum CPP, and so the OAS and the Guaranteed Income Supplement are, are also necessary for you. Given that circumstance, not only of yourself, but other senior artists who might be in that same position, what would you think would be a key kind of recommendation respecting tax laws, the tax system, uh, to try to support uh, those artists? Um, I was just going to mention one interesting thing that uh, uh, occurs with visual artists, and that is if you make a major sale, the way you get a, a bit of tax relief on that is you donate a work. And it's quite common that when you sell a work, you donate a work along with it, and you're able to deduct the value of the donated work. And the one time I had a huge sale, I did that. I had to donate a work in order to offset what the uh, tax would be on that sale. I think in terms of, of um, I mean, you know, the thing that comes up for me is how can you incorporate within the art, some sort of pension beyond just, um, you know, um, old age security and, and guaranteed income supplement. How can we begin to build pensions into that sort of thing? I mean, it's something we thought about when we were in negotiations. How can we build any kind of um, savings into this, any kind of pension? In terms of, of income, I think income averaging would be really important. Um, and one thing also that hasn't come up in terms of this, and I think it's the case, at least in the visual arts, is a lot of the artists make their living teaching. And that's their, in a sense, primary income. And, you know, some understanding in, in, in tax that you could average out that income as well so that you would be able to continue working as an artist. Well. I agree with all the other ones. I think income averaging, all those things are important, but those are just two thoughts anyway. Thank you. Anne-Marie? Well, uh, I, I will uh, piggyback on, on, on what Carl just said. Uh, when we did the study in Quebec of all the artists, uh, it was vive, uh, live, live from your art. You couldn't live from your art, but uh, mostly musicians uh, and writers uh, were the ones who made uh, the most money, <laughs> but it was because they were teachers, because they were uh, they had sound studios and they were composing music and everything, but not from their gig or they were teaching. And and I think that's a very good idea that uh, he has. That when you are an artist and you have to teach and everything, that that may be something that 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 could be looked at is that as long as you're teaching the the art in which you you practice uh maybe that that would be a good idea um you know tax averaging i hope that the government the federal government would do it but i think that if the prov the provinces has to be uh, lobbied for that too and you know it's it's um, if all the provinces or most of the the big provinces Ontario British Columbia 
uh, if if they were to implement that and the federal government implement that, that would certainly help. But I like the idea of tax averaging of um, vernacular uh, work, uh, the, the, the work related to your art. And I think that that's uh, that's a good venue. Um, it, let me just, uh, I've worked in this field, as I said, for a long time. Just <laughs> Put a couple of things on the table just for information. Um, uh, once many years ago, the Canadian uh, Conference of the Arts put on the table the issue of a tax deduction for artistic income, and it was supported, are you ready for this, by the Canadian Council of Chief Executives, because they said, yes, it would be a good way to promote creativity. And so, you know, we're, we're, we, we have in the past been able to build some allies on that question. And then uh, with respect to income averaging, this is something that doesn't just, yes, it affects artists clearly, uh, but it doesn't just affect artists. There are other professions and something as very significant as the Carter Royal Commission on Taxation many, many years ago Wait. condemned the government for having remove the ability to, to back average your income for uh, tax purposes and uh, said that it would be equitable for all taxpayers to be able to do that. So we've had some support there. Um, let me turn to a, a different a, a approach to this issue. Um, we uh, obviously, uh, we represent older artists. That's That's who's with us today. Um, and ageism is definitely uh, uh, playing a role here. And I wonder if, particularly the two artists on this panel, if you have experienced ageism in any of these ways, because it would affect your income potentially very significantly, or if you're aware of other people who have. And, and again, kind of focusing on what it means to be able to earn a living in the profession. So, Fern. Sure. Well, as you can tell, I'm a 68-year-old woman with silver hair. I think I, by heritage, I had very naturally silver hair. And when digital cameras came in, you couldn't keep ahead of dyeing your hair, quite frankly. And, and Meryl Streep had done The Devil Wears Prada. So there was some example of older women uh, playing leading roles. Um, but we've observed that the income of actors in North America in particular um, for women in on camera work, be, be an actor or, or other vocations, it, kind of mid thirties is kind of your peak earning years, and you might have fifteen good peak earning years, but mid thirties is kind of uh, um, uh, a knock. And what was interesting for me was I always worked in TV and film and very steadily and made a nice living, did some voice work and radio, and we still have radio drama. But I also made a lot of money um, subsidizing my life doing comedy commercials, which were very high paying national and international commercials. And the ageism in the commercial world is extraordinary. And your income just falls right off a cliff. You may know um, that the commercial actors in Canada now have been locked out um, for 155 days. So people's earnings have really, really been hurt. So it's it's such an everyday part of the recorded media business that it's breathtaking. And the idiocy of it, particularly from the US studios, we've all worked very hard on ageism and you know gender equality and diversity, equity, and inclusion, belonging issues. But ageism is rampant in recorded media. So you have to do many things. You have to be a multi-hyphenate, write, direct, create, promote other people's work, write your own web series. You have to to survive. Carl. Am I mute out there? Um, well, I think ageism done, doesn't affect us as much as it directly affects actors for probably obvious reasons. But you do notice as you get older, a kind of dropping away of interest. But it's not total. I mean, and it also depends on the individual. I think some artists, um, you know, um, are, are less noticed in, in, in their later years and other artists. I mean, I think of Michael Snow, who just recently passed away, maintained a kind of presence in, in, the, in the arts um, until he was, well, until he passed away. Um, so it really depends on the particular career trajectory, et cetera, et cetera. 
but I think there is a kind of generational shift. In other words, what you begin to notice is all the attention begins to focus on the up and coming kind of, you know, 20, 30 year old artists and that sort of thing. And you get acknowledged from time to time, but not to the degree you might have when you were younger. So it's sort of there, but I don't think it's as severe as it is in, in performance. Again, let me put on the table for particularly some consideration that break, break, breakout groups that um, uh, while you two uh, are not in the situation where you're, uh, you're in the application for grant period of your career, and in fact, in Fern's case, it's really not the case unless you're putting on an independent theater production or something like that, but I think it would be useful to discuss, again, in the breakout groups, if people who are older professional artists are witnessing increasing difficulty in obtaining grants that they used to be able to obtain. Because the focus, of course, in Canada is all on emergent, emerging artists, on the equity-deserving communities, equity, diversity, and inclusion. Um, and, and I have a sense that the challenges for older artists are ignored entirely. And that, uh, if you compare what happens here with what happens particularly in the Scandinavian countries where older artists are able to go and obtain a grant, not for a specific work. Our granting system is all connected to a finished outcome. In Scandinavia, senior artists, older artists are able to obtain a grant to do what they want to do <laughs> uh, because they are mature professionals with a long and distinguished career. And here, we're going to give you some money so you can go away and reflect and you may create something even newer and more dynamic uh, in, in doing that. And of course, that's a long way from where we are in Canada. Anyway, so just a comment from me on, on grants. Um, I just... Uh, Wonder if any of you have a final word you want to make. We're coming to the end of our time, and I do want to make a comment and a suggestion, a proposal for the uh, for the uh, breakout groups. So we'll start with you, Anne Marie, since you didn't get go in the last round. I, I I'd say go for it, and and I I wish you a good reflection. I think that uh, lots of the solutions have already put. Put, we've been put in place right now. We, we've discussed them. Uh, I think that uh, I think you've got everything plus uh, your mind to uh, to get uh, to get to it. I wish you luck. Um, I think you deserve it, and I think that we all deserve it as Canadians. We all deserve to have uh, older artists, uh, well, get what they want <laughs> and a good living. Carl. I think, you know, the, the biggest challenge that faces us is getting provincial status the artist legislation because they, it's in the provincial level that most of our gains can be made and that we're losing out on. Um, so that would be my major thing is, is getting status. And unfortunately, we got conservative governments across most of the provinces, so it's not going to happen soon, unfortunately. But it is something we need to do. And I just want to thank you for, for this opportunity. Um, and um, we got to keep moving ahead. Pardon. I would just say to all of us, whatever our disciplines, it's no time to sit back. I don't care how challenging and, and mulish the governments and how resistant they might be. You can never stop knocking on that same door with that same justified request. And I'm I'm going I'm inspired by everybody here today. You know, the equitable argument will get you the furthest. But I, th I actually believe there's a window of opportunity, regressive governments aside or good governments encourage, but it's whatever group or association or loose affiliation you may have with any of your peers, it's better to do it as a group because individually you feel very vulnerable, but with a group, you have some strength and um, go with the pandemic energy. It's got to be different. Um, uh, that's a that's actually a great uh, segue, uh, Fern, because again, I think we do have an opportunity here. 
Uh, we have a government that's listening a little bit at the federal level. Yes, we have a lot of work to do at the provincial level, but we also have other, you know, other very strong forces that are out there that are moving, you know, opening up a window of opportunity for us. Okay. And so in that sense, I want to uh, put the following on the table for the working group, for the breakout groups. So um, given that we have this opportunity, I'd like to challenge each of the groups to consider what two or three government policies or programs or measures would be most beneficial, are most needed to support older professional artists today. What is it? Is it the resale right if you're a visual artist, as, as Carl has put on the table? Is it income averaging? Is it a universal basic income? Is it a way to improve position with respect to pensions? Or is it that basic uh, uh, deduction for artistic income from your income tax? So with that, I would like to sincerely thank uh, my panelists. It was a wonderful uh, discussion that we had. I don't know if any of the other people on online believe that, but uh, <laughs> I enjoyed it. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And my thanks to all of you as well. Thank you, Gary Neal, Carl Beveridge, Anne-Marie Desroches, and Fern Downey. Lots to talk about. So why don't we do that? It's uh, time to start the breakouts. As Gary mentioned, we are going to focus on the two or three government policies or programs or measures most needed to support older professional artists today. And for the facilitators of each breakout, that question will be posted in your chat uh, uh, window so you'll have something to refer to. We'll regroup uh, afterwards to hear a summary of the discussions. The breakouts are going to last for about 30 minutes. So enjoy your breakouts. You're all back now. Okay, everybody's back. We're back, as Johnny Carson used to say. Um, so let's talk about what uh, came out of the breakout sessions. I'm happy to, to begin. Basically, when it came to Gary's questions of the two or three things that, um, that governments could implement that would be of most beneficial, uh, it was, <laughs> we had a small group and the small group thought all of the above they thought that income averaging definitely would be important. Um, one of one of the members, because we had uh, we had a dance artist, a couple of visual artists, a writer, and an actor, and representing Quebec and BC, Ottawa, Toronto, and Newfoundland. Um, so we had uh, had a fairly good spread and a fairly good diversity of uh, artistic disciplines, and. Um, uh, the the idea that uh, Quebec has of not the idea but the actual policy of the first fifteen thousand dollars of um, uh, copyrighted income would be tax free. There was a great deal of interest in that. Uh, resale rights, yes, was also considered very important, especially because, gosh, they even have that in the United States. So why don't we? You know. And especially because it isn't going to cost the government anything if they bring that in. So they thought that was that was very important. Basic income, something along the lines of CERB. A uh, couple of people said, yeah, that's that's really important. So I think that pretty much covers it. We also talked about um, intergenerational um, collaboration and how we find a common voice. Is it better for... Uh, Arts, arts organizations or artist organizations, for example, to pitch the government as we did at Canon and, and Fern said that, uh, that Actra did as well about income averaging. Should we getting, be getting together and doing a joint proposal or would the government just say, okay, there, that's one proposal instead of 20 different organizations doing individual proposals and they're saying, wow, there's some, some real interest in this. Uh, so that's, that's I think, a topic for uh, future discussion. And the intergeneration, we had one emerging artist uh, who was a dance artist uh, oh, in our group, which was really interesting. He had some interesting points uh, to make about getting together intergenerationally. And I've talked him into joining one of our online salons down the road so that we can discuss this more. So I think that's it for, for my group. Gary, you were, you've been busy today. 
<laughs> not only chairing the uh, the panel, but uh, facil facilitating one of the breakouts. Uh, it was great. There were eight of us. Um, interesting distribution of disciplines, uh, a playwright, uh, writer, author, uh, and a couple of visual artists, um, Nova Scotia to Bowen Island, Cal a couple from Calgary, Aurelia, North Bay. And the one that came out on top actually was the income averaging. People felt that was the most significant. And a couple of people told stories about how uh, it would have an impact on them. Um, and we also talked about copyright uh, and also the educational exemption in copyright uh, that was removed by the Harper government. And the, our, the current government has promised for a long time that they were going to uh, re, uh, uh, reintroduce the, uh, or eliminate the educational exemption so that um, so that those works that are sold in the educational setting and used in the educational setting would continue to have royalty payments. Uh, and so that goes with the resale right. There's a package. Uh, and very interestingly, uh, another one that came up in our group is the public lending right, uh, which is the government program whereby uh, authors are compensated when their works are used in public libraries and other public institutions. Um, and there are limits to it. There's time limits in terms of the age of the book. If it's past 25 years since publication, sorry, you don't get it. And there's limits on the ability of any individual to collect uh, for, for a certain number of years. And so a couple of people felt that that is one that we could, uh, that we should talk about. Uh, there was some discussion about universal basic income. One of our, uh, one of our breakout group members felt that that was the the most significant, the most important. And there was a little bit of discussion around that since it is universal. And so the question of equity uh, that might be a challenge with respect to, for example, a tax exemption would not exist if, it, if the uh, program were truly universal. Um, so uh, we had a great discussion. Uh, we could have gone on a little bit longer, I think, uh, but uh, that's the, the report from my group thank you gary and actually the um uh the exemption for copyright came up uh in my group as well the writer in my group and pointed out even if it comes back what about all the income from all the years that it, the exemption was in place that the income that we lost along the way we'll never get that back uh dan your group so um, I'm going to start with a bit of a commercial because as head of the programs committee for the Canadian Artists Network, I wanted to make sure I thanked on behalf of the board, thank the panelists and the moderator today and to thank all the participants, everyone who was listening, everyone who participated in a breakout group. And uh, we're very happy to help build this uh, community of uh, elder artists. Uh, my group uh, consists of seven people. We were focused mainly in British Columbia and Ontario uh, with visual artists, uh, people working in music and um, uh, an actor as well. Um, our group, uh, one person actually uh, came up with an idea that was not discussed earlier today and uh, is worth some consideration, I think which is whether there could be some kind of a tax credit for volunteer work, because artists are always told to pay, pay your dues, you know, go work in a small theater or do this, that, or the other thing, and you're not going to be earning an income, but you're going to be learning and you're going to be contributing. Um, so is there any way to create a, a tax credit for volunteer work? It strikes me that that's the kind of thing that could be, structured in an equitable way because if you're volunteering uh, to help children or if you're volunteering to help um, elders or whatever it is you're volunteering um, you know and, and or as long as volunteering in the arts uh, counts maybe there is something that could be done under the income tax act in that regard um, another thing that came up was the administrative burden uh, it, for artists, for example, in trying to qualify for CERB uh, during the, the pandemic. Um, so it's a kind of non-monetary 
um, policy that the government could try to adopt so that there, uh, it seemed like some of the um, people administering CERB maybe needed a bit more education in terms of uh, artists who uh, have had a regular income, but they don't have a single employer. And, um, um, you know, what can be done to, to help people instead of putting up a, a, a giant brick wall? Um, and the last thing I'll, I'll, um, I'll volunteer is whether uh, there could be a benefit, which uh, our group would like to term the RESPECT benefit. So uh, specially geared for older artists, it would be somehow geared to the number of years that you've, you've participated and contributed to your artistic discipline. And once you have that body, whether it's 35 or 45 or, or 75 years of contributing, that should actually serve to increase your uh, minimum annual um, wage or stipend or whatever it is it's going to be called. So in other words, an acknowledgement that the years of contribution should have a positive effect on the amount of money during your senior years that you can earn. Anyway, it was a lively group. Uh, people did share some quite uh, personal things. And um, I wanted to thank my group and to thank everyone. And thank you, Dan, for all your work on this. And you notice that uh, a couple of the, the uh, suggestions, the volunteerism one, especially got a lot of reaction from uh, the folks watching. So ah, that... Good. That that could be a, a keeper for sure. Jan. Um it was really stimulating. We I there were uh, I think we had eight in the group. I actually didn't actually count it except looking at my notes. And they were primarily from uh British Columbia and Ontario, and most significantly um they were visual artists, a poet, musician, uh administrators, and we were fortunate enough to have the executive director, April Gritiski from CARFAC, uh, join us as well, which was really, really eye-opening. Um, one of the comments, again, my group was all women, and um, there was a question uh, from one of our members, why is it all women in the group, in the sessions, and what is the balance in terms of the can outreach, you know, the sort of membership breakdown between men and women. They thought that that would be very interesting and we have to look at that. Um, the, the two key areas I think that our group sort of landed on were universal basic income and income averaging. Uh, so that's there. Um, but what we talked a lot about was the emerging artists and that how many have experienced rejection because emerging artists has suggested that you are young and that uh, many, many artists had to start their career later because they were supporting families, they were trying to meet income, they had to take other jobs. And so they couldn't actually pursue their art form until later and then find that because they don't fit the age range of perceived emerging artists that they were excluded. One, uh, one of our members said that, you know, an award-winning uh, artist applied to Canada Council uh, twice and was rejected um, because uh, she, uh, and then she wondered if in fact it was because um, she didn't fit the bill of emerging artists when she was 85 uh, or is 85. And um, that, uh, ageism does seem to enter into the grant form. And April brought up a really important point that although uh, the stories exist, that Canada Council is so difficult to get funding from, both as an individual and as a, an organization, that in fact, uh, they only can give awards or grants to five to 10% of their applic applicants. Uh, there just isn't the funding in the system. And that's something that really needs to be addressed. Um, that uh, 
yeah, that I think that the repositioning or defining what emerging um, artists, um, it, uh, who they are, needs to happen across the system. Um, another artist, um, when she couldn't pursue art at the beginning, went into the corporate world, but in the corporate world, corporate world, she was subversive and created artist groups within the corporate world and influenced boards. Mm -hmm. And I thought that that was uh, really interesting because um, it's an artist thinking creatively how she can uh, help improve the position of artists uh, in the community. Uh, another, which was really interesting, um, one of our members has uh, negotiated with her kids and has said that instead of their her legacy going to her children, that her legacy would go to a foundation. And she set up the foundation already, and the foundation um, was to support uh, artists that uh, had a particular challenge and um, uh, and she uh, and initially um, uh, there wasn't a lot of response, and so she opened it up to emerging artists, and was very very clear that emerging artists existed beyond um, it wasn't an age qualification. And I think she said that one received uh, support from the foundation who was 88 years old, so um, that was encouraging. The other one, which was a great lead-in, was how um, one artist was did a an, um, an installation in the U.S. and was paid like thirty three cents an hour uh, for all the work that she did, and uh, then one day she got a check in the mail for three hundred and thirty dollars, and she was blown away by that, and she didn't know where it came from, and then pursued it and found out that that it was money that she received to be a juror in an arts, uh, for an arts organization, and that it was Carfax rates. And so she was incredibly grateful for that. And I know that whenever I am organizing something, I look for a way to pay the artists that contribute to, in the background. And I just thought that that was a real plus for Carfax um, and the importance. And then the last thing, and it came from um, April, which I thought was really interesting, um, that, you know, I, I think, am I right that Carfax is 50 years old? I'm not exactly sure. But um, they have been looking back at, um, April looked back at the proposals that they made 50 years ago or 45 years ago and was shocked at how many of those um, goals still exist. And then, in fact, they had only achieved one of the many that they'd set up at the very beginning of their organization. And she felt it was really important that some kind of database could be created to look at all the proposals that have gone forward over the years to fight these issues like uh, basic income, income averaging, those conditions, and reflect on what the where it broke down and learn from that experience and and take ideas from the past to bring forward to the future. So we thought that uh, we have a database and we just need to pick the brains of Gary Neal and then we will have this sort of uh, overview of um, where we've gone, where we started, what we can learn from and how we can move the needle forward. Um, and we were lucky to have Fern join us and, and be a part of the group, which was great. So uh, it was really stimulating. Thank you, Jan. And just as a little added comment, April Britsky, not only executive director of Carfax, she's a former board member of CAN back when we were in the called CSARN. So excellent. Yeah. Keith Martin Gordy, what do you have to say for yourself? Or more importantly, oh, not for much, your group? But, um, I'll do what I can. Um, so uh, we have people from Ottawa, Edmonton, Gabriel Island, Burlington, Toronto, uh, Hastings, I think it is, Ontario. Um, uh, so quite a, a 
range of disciplines, uh, visual artists, definitely, uh, psychology was part of it, um, a music musician and music engraver, uh, which was an interesting discipline. And uh, she mentioned that uh, didn't get a lot of uh, recognition for all that work, whereas in uh, you know, if you look at old scores, the engraver gets uh, gets right up there, same billing as the composer. Um, uh, we we had Bob Underwood from AFBS who, who joined us. Um, always good. Uh, theater, dance, uh, choreographer, um, and talked a bit about you know uh, having to to pivot when you hit a certain age. Uh, and and that was you know clear in in the theater and uh, certainly for a dancer. Uh, what else? A, a folklorist, I think, would be the title. Um, uh, craft and design. So quite a range of folks. Um, there's similar uh, <laughs> suggestions. You know, uh, basic income uh, or universal income. Um, tax averaging came up. Uh, there was some talk about, uh, interestingly enough, uh, communist Poland, uh, and then in communist Poland, uh, they, apparently they, they uh, under that regime, you they allotted X number of people in any given kind of job, which might include a, uh, an artist, and so the competition was terribly fierce and a very limited number of people who came into that category, but if you did. Uh, you know, you had you had your income. You were you, you were going to be uh, taken care of and and had your income. It was also mentioned that uh, in in Poland, uh, it's a requirement that you put money into a, a pension. You have to do it. Uh, and uh, this individual said that what they get now, uh, you know, in terms of retirement income from Poland, is about four times what they get in Canada. So it was interesting stuff. Um, there was talk about um housing how that is uh, something maybe that government policy can address i, I know as as a, a former uh, a board member of uh, pal vancouver the performing arts lodge uh, housing for seniors is absolutely critical especially for artists uh so whatever the government can do, do to to help that uh food security was another issue that came up uh that maybe the government could address um, one person talked about uh, their bank manager, I think it was when they uh, turned about 40 and, uh, you know, they were making a, a, an OK income, uh, said uh, you need to get property because when you hit, hit 60, you're going to you're going to be in trouble. So um, I but it also came up that if you're a young person now, probably all you're going to get is a tiny house and you'll be standing on one foot. So um, I think that's about it. Income splitting came up. Um, it, it was clear that uh, renting space, if if you're uh, if you have a discipline that requires space as a visual artist or you know a dance or whatever it might be, um, is uh, is a challenge. And perhaps there could be policy that could help uh, you know uh, pay pay for space to practice your your discipline. I think that's about it. Yeah. Okay. Good. Thank you, Keith. Uh, thank you. And uh, for... Gary, any final thoughts as the uh, the instigator of the discussion in the second hour? Uh, not about not about that, but uh, I want to sincerely thank uh, everybody who has been involved in uh, this maintaining creativity a conference, from Dan's chairing of the program committee to Scott, your own. Uh, involvement in the logistics. I think it's been an excellent uh, few days and I look forward to particularly hearing the input of those who attended about what we've done that was good, what we've done that might uh, need to be improved and uh, any other ideas that people may have about what we do with maintaining creativity now. Great. Thank you, Gary. And that just about wraps things up for our eighth annual conference. I can't believe it. We were a year in the making and it's over in three sessions. Uh, we encourage you, by the way, before I go, I just want to 
put in another plug to nominate an unsung hero in the arts. The Robert Johnson Visionary Artist Award is accepting nominations until November 15th on our website. And this year's winner will receive $2,500. Uh, I also invite you to continue the conversation at our next On Salon, which takes place Tuesday, November 14th at 1.30 p.m. Eastern Time. You can sign up on our website, which, as we have mentioned, is currently csarn.ca, but is about to become canartnet.ca. But either one will get you to uh, our website. We have a series of webinars coming up. How Artistic Practice Helps Protect Your Memory. That's happening later this month, and we'll have more on that next week. Financial Wellness for Older Artists coming up, and specifically for actors, a guide to self-taping. I want to add my thought, uh, thanks to our board of directors, led by our chair, Gary Neal, to the programming committee, led by Dan Lyon. Thank you to all of the breakout facilitators. Thank you to Canadian Webinar Solutions for their technical expertise. Thank you to Barrett Kaplan and Alfonso von Ziegler for producing our mentoring videos this week. And mostly, thank you for being with us this week. I mean, without you, all of this would have been pretty pointless. Uh, if you missed any of our three chapters, they will be posted on our website in the days to come. And a reminder, we'll be sending out that survey request through SurveyMonkey in the next few days. Please fill it out. It helps us report to the sponsors and funding bodies that made MC8 possible. We look forward to seeing you uh, again next fall for Maintaining Creativity 9. In the meantime, we wish you happy, healthy, and creative days because, of course, creativity lives forever. <laughs>